Oh yeah, and that's why Lake and Lake tracks are complete and utter dog crap. What? All right, hang on. Yeah, someone's at my door. Let me call you back. Who the hell could that be at this hour of the night? Hello? Oh, what the hell is this? It's a basket. No one's there. Someone just left a basket on my doorstep. Who the hell leaves baskets on doorsteps anymore? Huh. Uh, hang on, something's bundled up. Huh? What? Okay, that's a little weird. Oh my god. Oh. Hey, little guy, what are you doing here? Oh, you've seen better days. Let's go ahead and get you fixed up. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M60A1 main battle tank. Now the model that we have here is built for a private commission and belongs to a private collector. As I often mention in these build videos, I often take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now, as what was seen from the pre-video bumper, this video here is going to be a slightly different format compared to my other smaller scale 135th scale build videos that are showcased on the channel. Generally with those builds, I have a kit in the box, I do an in-box kit review, and then I go ahead and build a model and review and discuss certain attributes of the kit as well as areas to watch out for and even approve upon. This build here, on the other hand, is definitely going to be a different story. This build, like what was seen before, started off as a model that was already pre-built by another individual. They in turn sent the model to me where I went ahead and repaired the model and did some other alterations to it to bring it up to the state that you see it in this video. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of information and content coming at you. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is really doesn't need any introduction as it's one of the most famous and most successful post-World War II tank designs and that is the American M60A1 main battle tank. Now the M60A1 dates back to the mid-1960s and into the 1970s where this vehicle became the mainstay of the U.S. Armored Forces. The design itself dates back to the late 1950s where at the time the M48A3 patents were beginning to start showing their age and limitations with their design. They were going to be considered outdated compared to the new Soviet tanks which were on the drawing board and which were entering production during this period. The original M60 came out and was similar to the M48 in many respects but did have several more improvements compared to the original M48's design. Now that tank, although was superior to the M48, did have some other rooms for improvement and those changes went into the A1 version of the M60. The biggest and most noteworthy change between the original M60 and the M60A1 has to do with the shape of the turret. The original M60's turret utilized a all cast turtle back pattern of turret which was similar in design to the M48 while the M60A1's turret was redesigned to be pointier and longer, which gave the vehicle better ballistic protection, it would be this variation of the M60 which would enter into mass production, and this particular vehicle was in production for a number of decades. The unit not only became the mainstay of the U.S. armored force, but was also widely exported to many allied countries of the United States throughout the the remainder of the Cold War period. Like I mentioned before, the turret was really the only thing that changed of any substance. The vehicle still utilized the exact same fire control equipment and the exact same weaponry which was developed and used on the original M60 tank. The main gun was the 105mm L7, the 50 caliber machine gun was the M85, and the coax was also the M73 which to some tank crew's dismay, as both of those platforms did have some serious issues, but the M60 kept the, this basic armament package all the way up until really the end of its service life. 
For the main power pack, the vehicle kept the Continental V12, which was used on the original M60 and was also being fitted to other versions of the M48. And by all accounts, automotively, this engine was a very good performer. The vehicles were known to be very mechanically reliable, and from all the tankers that I've met and talked to, each of them really held this vehicle to a very high esteem. Now, Aldo in the 1980s, the M1 Abrams replaced the M60 as the main battle tank for the U.S. military, the U.S. Army continued to use upgraded versions of the M60 all the way up until the early to mid-1990s, and the Marine Corps also followed suit. In fact, the Marine Corps used the M60 further past the use that the Army had, since the Marine Corps didn't get the M1 Abrams tank until the mid-1990s time frame. Now, outside of the U.S. military, the M60 is still widely seen and in use today, again, from many of the countries that were issued these vehicles back during the Cold War period. Now before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the condition of the base starter model was in. And here's the model at the start of the build. Now like I stated before, this project is going to be a little bit different from my usual model showcase videos where they start off as unassembled kits that I build into their completed state. This guy here is going to be a rebuild and a repair type project. Basically, in a nutshell, this model here started off as a late 80s, early 1990s Tamiya release of the M60 A3 main battle tank kit. The model was procured by the owner and built to the condition that you see it here in the late 1990s. The model then went into storage for a period of time and was recently unboxed and sent to ECA in order for me to do the rebuild. Now the model itself was built primarily out of the box by the owner and he did a pretty decent job overall. The kit itself was assembled very well and the paint that was applied to it was done in a very thin manner. He tried to apply some kind of a Merc camouflage scheme and the paint itself again looks to be applied with an airbrush and are applied in nice thin layers which makes the rebuilding process a little bit easier. Now one of the concerns that the owner had was that when this vehicle was in storage at some period of time a little furry mouse got into the packaging and made it his home because of which the mouse decided to turn some of these rubber poly caps here into a tooth scratching post and because of that the little furry friend went ahead and gnawed on the hubcaps. The mouse went ahead and had its way with several of the hubcaps on this side, as well as also a couple on this side as well. Now, some other damage that the mouse did to the vehicle has to do with the commander's cupola hatch. You'll notice that it's missing on the model, and from what I was told by the owner of the, of the kit, the mouse went ahead and also thoroughly gnawed this piece to basically non-existent. So, this is going to be one aspect of the build that is going to have to be addressed. Other damages that are found on the model are basically pretty sparse. We have here a broken strut that connects the gypsy rack to the rear portion of the turret. And you'll notice on the back here, there would have been the provision for mounting of the snorkel. Now, this is actually a good thing that this happened. I'm going to go over it in a second. The model itself, one of the the requirements that the commissioner had was that he wanted to take this model and further backdate it to an M60A1 of the mid-1970s time frame. The reason for that is because the owner of this vehicle here is a veteran and he served with the U.S. military during that time frame and served and crewed on the M60A1 amongst many other tanks that I'm not really going to go over much in this video. But because of that he wanted to backdate this tank further to that type of appearance. Now, one of the aspects of the build that's going to streamline that is that the Tamiya M60 A3 kit, in addition to giving you the parts to turn it into the A3, also give you parts to keep it as the M60 A1. And the builder went ahead and 
went with that route for his build. The most noticeable change between the two is the barrel. This model here features the M60A1 pattern of the 105 millimeter gun. Now, why this is different from the A3 was that one of the modifications done to the A3 was the addition of a thermal sleeve, which was added to these sections over here. These thermal sleeves are present on the A3 kit from Tamiya, but the guy went ahead and swapped it out with this backdated version of the barrel here, which will definitely make the conversion process all that much more easier. It's because it is backdating, is why the removal of the snorkel was also a benefit. When the owner built the model, he built it with the Marine Corps pattern, which as you can see has the USMC markings on some of the bumper codes. And the Tamiya kit does have the option of having the piece with the extended snorkel. Now, obviously to backdate this to the US Army variant from the 70s, the snorkel is not going to be a part that's going to be used. And because of that, it had to go. Now, fortunately, during the model shipping, the snorkel got bumped somewhere during the way, and the whole piece simply just popped right off. Now, this was a very happy accident because you'll notice that the piece popped off in an extremely clean manner. One thing about these M60s and also the M48 as well is because with these grills that we have back here, when you glue on that little bit of accessory, the, the adhesives will go into these little grill fins and just solidify and will basically ruin the detailing underneath. Now, obviously, if you're gluing the piece on, it's not going to be important, but if you're backdating it like I am for this kit, this is definitely something that's going to be a key point of this build. Luckily, with the type of adhesives that the builder used, more likely, I want to guess, is Tester's Red Tube Glue, which has a tendency of not aging very well. The piece just simply popped off, but it popped off in a way that didn't damage anything, which, again, is a definite happy accident and is going to make this conversion all that much more quicker. Now, another area that's going to need to be addressed are the air filtration boxes. If I hold the vehicle up to the camera and leave it there for a few a few moments. Let's see if anyone who has a sharp detail eye can identify what the problem might be. Did you catch it? Well, if you did, congratulations. If you didn't, the problem is with this air filter box. If we take a look at the vent here for the intake, it's mounted on in reverse. This one is how it should be affixed, and this one is going to need to be addressed and repaired just prior to the repainting of the vehicle. Now from there, right, let me go ahead and take the model apart. Like I said before, the builder did an adequate job at building the model primarily out of the box, and that goes all the way down to not gluing the upper and lower hulls together, which is straight out of the Tamiya instructions and is a carryover from the old motorization days. Here you can see he went ahead and mounted on the stock detailing for the front driver's position. And he went ahead and went a little bit further and plugged up the little motorization holes, which are a staple found on these old pattern of Tamiya models. The bodywork was done in a pretty efficient manner. A little bit of polishing will be done just to blend everything out further, but by and large, this was a nice feature done by the builder. Now, outside of the repairs that need to be made where the kit's going to be enhanced further has to with the type of build that the commissioner is requesting. Like I said before, he wants to have this model better replicate an M60A1 that he served on in the mid 70s. And to do that, I'm going to need to make some changes to the stock model. First and foremost, the biggest change is going to be done with the track. Now the track that we have here is a stock to me a track and the track is uh, normally, 9 times out of 10, perfectly suffice for this project. The Tamiya tracks are the single piece vinyl type. They are adequately detailed for their medium. They do have a good roll to them for motorization use. And the pieces do have a nice good stance to them. However, the issue with these tracks, why they can't be used on this project, is the thread pattern. The M60 A3 kit and also the M60 updated A1 kit that Tamiya have utilize this non-directional octagonal link. This is a nice set of tracks, but this type of pattern would have been developed in the late 70s and the early 80s and would have came after the type of vehicle that 
the customer served on. For his vehicle, his tracks would have been the original Chevron pattern. Now, because of that, these got to be swapped out. Now, in their place, I went ahead and tracked down a single piece vinyl Chevron pattern M60 track from Dragon. The Dragon tracks that we have here, this one is either from their M60A2 Starship or their old original pattern M60 main battle tank kit. Which, by the way, I've built examples of both of those and can be found on the ECA Facebook and the ECA YouTube channel. Like I mentioned in both of those videos, the stock Dragon tracks are very nicely done. The detailing on them is more than adequate for the type of job that we have here. Now the track itself was simply acquired off of eBay. Outside of the track, the next modification is going to come with the searchlight. Again, being from a vehicle of this period, a Xenon searchlight would have been fitted to the front portion here of the mantlet, and this is something that I have on stock and will be added to this model. Furthermore, the vehicle will get some other smaller tweaks and changes, but the other major change is going to come with the paint and the markings, which I'll, of course I'll go over at the tail end of this video. So. With that all the way, let's go ahead and get this project started. However, before I go ahead and lift a finger and start working on this build, the first thing I'm going to do is prep it and get it ready for a nice, long, soapy bath. The reason for that is twofold. The number one reason it has to go back to what I said before with the mouse situation. As we all know, mice are not exactly the most hygienic of creatures and they're excrement is known to have some serious health effects. Now, that's not too much of a concern for this model here because the owner did wash the model nice and thoroughly before he went ahead and sent it on its way here, but it's just a precautionary measure that I want to further take. Another aspect of washing the model has to do with the rebuild process. If anyone is has an old 135th scale model that they acquired either at a flea market or on eBay or even they have one or two in their collection that they wish to rebuild and repaint, a bath should be the first thing that they do because it helps remove any of the surface dust that might be on the surface. Dust comes in lots of different configurations from really fluffy to that fine material that just doesn't want to go away with an air with a tube of high compressed air or even with just a regular rinsing. That little layer of dust can cause issues when it comes time for the repainting process and it could just ruin a good paint job. So the bath is required for that. And another aspect is that the bath will help loosen any sort of detail components that are on the model but are a little bit on the iffy side of their bonds. Like was mentioned before, this model was more than likely glued together with Tester's red tube model glue, which after the model begins to age, loses its bond and starts fall parts begin to start falling off. When the when this model here is submerged under some warm water, this will accelerate the process and will make the rebuild of the model go together in a more efficient manner as the parts can fall off in a controlled state, which then can be then reapplied with better adhesives. As opposed to just winging it, at that rate, some parts might even get loose on you when you're painting it, and you're gonna have to now track down and re-glue on parts during a painting process, which again is something that's less than ideal. So, enough jibber-jabber. This guy here is gonna become a submarine, or more likely it's gonna be like those other m 68 ones which were turned into coral reefs, for the time being, of course. And here we have the model going through its bath. The model is thoroughly submerged in this tub that we have here. Now the solution is mostly comprised or was originally comprised of warm tap water. Keyword on the warm, you don't want to have the water too hot because if you do, the plastic runs the risk of getting soft and deformation may occur. In addition to the water, I threw in a mix of some dish soap as well as a splash of Simple Green. This is something that I've been experimenting with recently after watching several videos from Retro Blaster, where he utilizes a lot of that for his restorations on old toys. So far, I've seen the solution work pretty well with dislodging some of the surface dust found on the nooks and crannies, which I'll go over once I take the tank out of the water. 
Now the tank itself has been sitting in this tub in this condition now for most of the day. And at this point now, I think I could start draining out the water and giving the model one final rinse over. Now, if you notice the tank, like I said before, is thoroughly submerged. This is done with weights. The plastic models themselves are actually pretty light and they tend to either float when placed in water like this or will have a neutral buoyancy. For these type of rebuilds, I like to weigh them down with any sort of heavy objects just to keep the model firmly on the ground so that the solution could run its course. Now for weights, you could use really anything, but what works actually pretty well are old coins like nickels, dimes, quarters, pennies, what have you. They'll weigh the model down and you don't have to worry about any of the pieces corroding or possibly rusting on you on the inside of the vehicle. Now periodically, I would check in on the model to see how the cleaning process was going and I would start fiddling with some of the plastic bits that needed to have been removed for painting as well as also for some repairs. And you'll see that the setup was basically a success. I was able to dislodge the air filter box that I mentioned before as well as the jerry cans and even the tow cables are very loose now and can easily be popped off with an X-Acto knife. Well, at this point here, I'm going to start pouring out the water. Now, of course, this is done in this bathtub, which will cut down on the mess. And I'll also be able to see if any parts are trying to get washed down the drain. So let me quickly close the valve here. Because I know a few other smaller parts possibly fell off. So let's go ahead and start the pour out. Okay, with the water now fully drained out, you can see the amount of parts that were loosened up by the bath. Of course, I mentioned the jerry can and the air filtration box, but you could also see one of the flare boxes was dislodged, as well as two of the, or was that three? Yeah, about two or three of the small little replacement track pads that we have here mounted on the rear bustle rack. Let me go ahead and take out any of the weights on the inside. Some random bits of hardware. Okay, before I could now start actually working on it, I'm going to wash off the, or rinse off both of the upper and lower hulls with some straight up warm tap water. This should help remove any sort of dust as well as the any detergents which may have or any leave a residue on the surfaces from the bathing process. Okay, well, now that that's all wrapped up, you know, let this guy dr fully dry and air it out, to which then I can bring him into the shop and start the rebuilding process. Oh, another thing I want to point out, one of the other advantages that the bath has is dislodging any of the water slide decals which were applied by the previous builder. Of course, the decals being just water slides, they are very susceptible to water and specifically warm water so by soaking the model into the tub like I had it the pieces or the decals just dissolved and floated away. If any remnants are left they could easily just be scratched off with your fingernail at this point here. Okay and here's the model now just about ready for paint. Let me go ahead and take the turd off and go over some of the mods that were made briefly. Okay, starting with first with the upper and lower hull, you can see that on the inside here, oh, I got some accessories I gotta dump out. Forget about those. All right, you can see the little interior or the little mini interior that the model came with. Now, 
All I did was I added some stain weathering to the inside and I painted the seat pad of the driver's seat with the black that you see here. That's basically all the interior it's gonna get. On the upper, I went ahead and just painted the hatch here with the base coat. Had some spillage on the inside, but it doesn't matter because of course it's not gonna be visible. Also on the lower hull, you can see I went ahead and did a little bit more body work to remove those motorization holes. Now the builder originally did do this, but there were, some, there were some cracks starting to show up where the bodywork was originally done and it was still faintly visible in some areas. So why not? I went ahead and just polished away with a new layer of bodywork. Same thing was also done right here on the back. There was a seam line that is present and this seam line is present on these Tamiya M60A1s just with the way the rear plate here gets fitted. This is also true on the 172nd scale SG kits as well, oddly enough. Regardless, I went ahead and deleted the seam here with the bodywork as such. All I'm going to do now is scrape away some of the paint here on the front lip because the upper and lower hulls are permanently going to be affixed. Now, the reason why I'm going to be doing that is because of the upper hull here. There are these two little sheet metal wings which descend from the rear mud flap here and they come down and make contact with the rear tail light. This is something that is one of those trademarks on the M60 and it's one of those things that have always been a bit of a problem and or I should say a little bit of a pain when it comes time to building these as models. Now for the wings, I'll be utilizing these two pieces over here. These are spares from an Eshi M60A1 project that I did a number of years ago. A video of that can be found on the ECA channel. I know it's a shameless plug, but plug nonetheless. And these pieces here are basically be used stock with the exception there was a small little pin mark on this section over here and found on the opposite side. And I just buffed it away with a Dremel. These wings are best installed on all of these M60 series once the upper and lower hulls are permanently attached. Now because the model is static and is not motorized, obviously the need to have the upper hull removed from the lower is just not important. While on the upper hull, you'll notice I did a little bit of bodywork right here on the front. On these Tamiya, and I believe also on the Academy M60 kits, there is a small little divot in this section over here because of the injection plug that we have which is used to pin the upper and lowers together. This little divot is easily removed with a little shot of, of glazing putty that I have here. Now moving back, here you can see the air filters. You'll notice I removed both of them. And the reason I did that is because of the styling of the air filter. Here we have one of the air filters which were originally supplied with the model. And you'll notice this is a later pattern of air box filter. For the type of period that the owner of this tank wants, he it's better with the earlier pattern that I have here. Now these two units, again, are spares from the Eshi M60A1 build. And I just had these pieces lumbering around my spare bin, so I just took them out, assembled them to the way you see it, and these are now gonna be dropped directly in place. What's nice about the Eshi pieces, if you notice, they are hollow on the air breather tubes, which is a nice bit of detailing, and the overall quality detailing itself are pretty good on these Eshi kits. I've Probably mentioned that a few times in the 172 builds that I've done a little while ago. The scale of the pieces are pretty good, and if you notice, they're just going to drop directly into place here, thus backdating this model to one that would be more appropriate for this era. Now, periodically bouncing back to the suspension, like I said before in the unboxing portion, some aspects of this model were damaged due to a mouse, and some of that damage involved the hubcaps being nibbled on. So what I went ahead and did was I took one of the other M60s that I had in the stash and I made a mold of the hubcaps. With the pieces casted, they are an exact replica of the ones which would originally been found on these Tamiya kits. Because of that, they just get mounted in the exact same way. Now, because the tooling of the original pieces are that flexible rubber poly material and these ones here are a hard resin the holes need to have been drilled out carefully with a pin vise to make way for extra clearances so that the pieces can fit onto this to the swing arm axles in a nice smooth way otherwise if you try to shove them onto the piece and it's too tight the resin's clearly going to buckle and break as opposed to the poly cap which would expand and slip on because I needed to expand the holes, these are going to be glued in place and the end result will still leave for the model having fully spinnable wheels, which sounds funny, but it's actually one of the requirements that the owner requested. 
Okay, from the upper hull now takes us to the turret. Now the turret itself did receive a few little modifications, again, just to help backdate the model compared to the original Tamiya release. Now first and foremost, you'll see that I removed a few of the extra details. The smoke grenade launchers are gone and their sections have been blended away to remove any sort of appearance that they were once there. And also removed our little flare boxes which would have been located on these two sides here of the turret. Again, these would not have been present on the mid-70s period, which, again, the owner of the tank wants to replicate. The jerry cans will be remounted, but after the model is fully painted and weathered. You can also see I did a little bit of bodywork on this section over here. There was just a small little seam that was protruding out from the paintwork, so I went ahead and addressed it. On the back here, that little section of rail that had those octagonal spare rubber pads was amputated. It was easier just to snip the two pieces off here and here and replace it with a piece of wire as opposed to trying to manually try to save the plastic bar by trying to pry those little octagonal pieces off. They were glued on pretty well, so it was a fool's errand trying to save it. It was easier just to amputate it and replace it with the way you see it here. Now, on the bottom, you'll notice I kept the tow cable fitted. The tow cable, the builder did a decent job on, and it wasn't really necessary to try and pry it off. If anything, I'll just work around it when it comes time for the paint and weather work. Now, you'll notice that I also went ahead and fabricated the little clips on these sections over here, which on the real M60 would be used to help keep the tow cable in place, and these are absent on the stock Tamiya and Academy kits. The pieces themselves were fabricated out of, out of thin strips of aluminum, which were made from a soda, a soda can. So there's your quick tip for how to scratch build. From the searchlight, this now takes us to the mini turret cupola. Now, what was mentioned before, the hatch was missing, and this one here was, again, a replacement part from Eshi from the spare parts bin. The Eshi hatch fits onto the Tamiya M60 with not a whole lot of modifications. The only mod that I did was that on the hinge that you see right here, the Eshi one is a little bit on the snug side. So with a couple passes of a needle file, I removed the material on the hatch itself, and then once the adequate material was removed, the hatch simply just drops directly in place. Another modification, or I should say extra detailing I added, were the little lift rings that you see here on the back and two on the sides. These were added with a pin vise and a small little bit of floral wire. Now starting with the model suspension, like I mentioned before, the hubcaps on this model, some of them need to have been replaced with resin copies. Now that the model is fully complete, you can see that the resin and the original poly caps that were supplied with the kit blend in absolutely effortlessly. Now moving up from the main roll wheels takes us to the return rollers. Now these are obviously the kit original ones and were reused for this build. During the building process I went ahead and removed all six of these units for a couple reasons. The first reason was when the tank went into its soapy bath, the glues became weakened on a few of these pieces and they just simply popped off. Another one or two, I believe, were, was also on the weaker side, more than likely due from the years of the model clunking around when it was in its storage. And another benefit though that the why the wheels were removed had to do with painting. It, this is a tip for anyone who's painting any Patton or Pershing based vehicle. The rubber rims on these rollers and also on that little trailing idler on the M47 are actually pretty tricky to paint. There's not a whole lot of surface area on these pieces here so you're going to really need to be careful with your paintbrush. Now when it comes to painting them, I always found it easier to paint them off of the vehicle as obviously with the top portion here of the tin work it kind of inhibits the paintbrush from getting away and you could run the risk of over swiping with your rubber paint material. So it's always best done off of the model. Once everything is painted then they just get remounted as you see it here. Now from the rollers brings us to the sprocket. Now the sprockets on this model here are 100% stock with no mods made to them. Now generally on many of my 135th scale M60 or patent based builds you'll see that I add the mud holes found on the portion here of the sprocket. Now this one was left stock because not all of the M60A1 sprocket castings actually had the mud slits. Some vendors out there just left them emitted and others had them added. So by leaving the sprockets stock without the mud slits, it's not inaccurate. And for this model here, it was just one less thing that I had to worry about. 
From the sprocket now brings us to the track. Now, like I mentioned before, the model would have originally had the non-directional octagonal pattern of tracks. Now, those tracks are very nice, but because the owner wanted this model backdated to an M68-1 from the mid-1970s, this pattern of track would have been more appropriate. Now, for the track itself, it's the Dragon DS Tyrene sets that I acquired off of eBay loose. Now, these tracks here are awesome. I mean, it, they went on without any sort of problems. Now note the Dragon Track times absolutely perfectly with the Tamiya Sprocket. This is something that you need to watch out for whenever you're replacing tracks on a model for one reason or another. Because depending on the maker of the kit as well as the vehicle type as well as also the tracks and the type of replacement tracks that you're using, in not all cases will the timings fit and this may lead to one issue or another. But for this model here, that just wasn't the case. They went on as simple as the original Tamiya tracks would have. Now for the paintwork, it's my usual format where I paint the sections which would be rubber differently from the way I would paint and weather the components which would be metal. Now on the M60, of course, the metal parts would consist of the, the connecting sections here, the tooth clamp section in the middle. On the inside, we would have the actual guide horn tooth. And then you would have the little metal sections which would emerge from the rubber pads that we see along both sides of the track. Now if you notice, the metal bits are painted to represent a rusty type look to them, which is definitely common on this vehicle type, as well as the legacy vehicles that came before, like the M48s. Now if the metal sections are going to be painted to mimic a rusty type look, then the rubber sections also need to be weathered to a similar extent to avoid any anachronistic type issues. Now, the rubber sections, you'll notice that they are painted in a dark gray or rubber type coloring. And then the wear is also added to them, but instead of rust, it's more of a white type chalky type look to them. Now on the actual chevrons themselves, they are gonna be a bit darker compared to the ones found the rubber found on the intersections here because these sections here actually make contact with the ground and are always getting rubbed when the vehicle's in use. And before we leave the back, I just want to point out the tail lights. You notice I just simply painted them in red. Now this is a ding with the Tamiya kit. On the Tamiya tooling, this rear section over here with its detailing is left untouched from the original M60 release from 1970. Now on that model there, there are absolutely no details found on the cat eye lenses found in the rear section. Now this is again a problem with the Tamiya kit and which is why you see a lot of aftermarket suppliers offering rest and replacement units for these fittings here from Legends and I believe Hobby Fan is another one to name a few. Now I also want to point out that on the Academy release of the M6A1, the Academy kit actually went ahead and changed this up and improved the detailing found on the cat's eye lenses. So <laughs> theoretically, the Academy kit is a more polished version of the Tamiya tooling. But for this model here, I just simply went with a swipe of gloss red paint. Now it takes us to the air filtration boxes. Now, like I said before, these were another change from the original build. The boxes here are the ones from the SU model and were used because these ones here are for an early M60A1 pattern compared to the units that are supplied with the Tamiya kit. Now, even though these units here are from SU, they mount onto the Tamiya tooling without any sort of problems. They blend in with the surface detailing basically flawlessly and you'll notice that they do not make any sort of contact whatsoever when the turret is rotated. From the air filtration box it now takes us to the front of the hull. Starting with the heater exhaust pipe, the only modification I did was I drilled out the section over here with a pin vise which always helps the look of these units. Now from there it takes us to the bow headlights. Now the bow headlights and their brush guards are totally stock, but one modification I did make was to this little bracket that we have here. On the real M60 kit, there is a support bracket that supports the side portion here of the brush guard. And these of course are missing on the Tamiya kit. 
And I believe they're also missing on the Academy one as well. Now on this model here, one little tip that I always recommend is with a small little piece of Plastruck angle, I just fabricated the little section here and just mounted it to these two locations. By adding this detail, this always improves the look of your stock Tamiya or Academy kit. Now, it's also important to point out that if you're using one of the aftermarket sets from Legends, it supplies you this set with some PE, which of course is highly recommended if you're going that route. But if you're not going with the PE and you just want to just enhance the stock plastic ones that are supplied with the model, just a little piece of plastic rectangle is really all you need. Now from there, I just want to point out the fire extinguisher box, just like on many of these pattern of M60s with this type of paintwork. It is painted in red for high visibility and it's just something added to help make the model pop further. From there this now brings us to the turret. Now I went over basically what all the mods to the turret were before but now that the model is fully painted you can see how everything blends in. Starting with the little rail here found on the gypsy rack. Moving up to the, to the little support ribs that we have here, which of course need to have been replaced. And on the turret sides, you can see the bodywork that was, or I should say you can't see the bodywork, which, which is the point, that was made to these areas over here where we had the flare box holder for the later A3, and also the smoke grenade launcher, which would have been located in this section here. From there, this now brings us to the searchlight. Now, like I may have mentioned before, the Xenon searchlight that you see on this model here is a spare from a Dragon build that I did a little while ago. And like I've said in my other Dragon patent builds, the Xenon searchlight that's applied with them is absolutely gorgeous. It is fantastically detailed, and it definitely has a lot of accuracy to it. However, I will point out that building one is a bit on the difficult side. With the way the searchlight is designed, you will have several seams to contend with. Now, on a normal day, this is, you know, fine and dandy, but with the Xenon searchlight, because of the handles that are molded in, and also you have these small little fasteners found on this little disc here in the back, it's always problematic. So much so that on these builds, I generally just snip off the handles with a clean cut snip, and this allows me then better access to polish away the seam work. So. It's always something that's a bit of a hassle, but it is worth the risk because once done, they look great. Now, on the interior here, you can see the, the reflector found in the rear portion. And also the inside is painted in black, which is seen on the real vehicles. On the lens here, you'll notice the little red trim. This is a gasket, which again is also seen on the real counterparts. Now to mount the Dragon, Xenon searchlight to the Tamiya mantlet was fairly easily done, but it did take a little bit of tweaking to it. The mounts that are found on the Tamiya kit do have their little connecting balls to them. These were simply just amputated off, giving you a nice flat surface to mount the searchlight. I did have to add a small little piece of styrene to the center portion right here in order for the piece to be elevated so that it makes contact with the support for the searchlight. That was really the only mod that needed to have been made. Other than that, it just went on in a fairly easy manner. Now, because of the searchlight, you will have to have the power cord going to it, and this is pretty easily added. This receptacle here is found on the Tamiya kit, and I just simply drilled it out with a pin vise. And a matching hole was drilled on the back portion here of the searchlight. The wire itself is a small, electrical wire that you know I just have on hand for my other build and really works perfectly for this model. It's a really thin gauge and I believe it's a silicone coated wire. I really recommend it for anyone who's doing any sort of patent or even a Type 74 build that has these external searchlights. They go where you want them to go and really do look good when done. And also being black you don't have to paint it. What you see here is the stock original color of the material. The link to this, to a spool of this material, is found on Amazon in the comment, or I should say in the video description listed below. From there brings us to the Commander's Mini Turret Cupola. I went ahead and added the little lift rings, which I may or may not have mentioned before, and here you can see the Eshi Cupola hatch now fully painted, and again blends in absolutely seamlessly with the rest of the build. Moving further back, you can see the antenna base. And this was just simply drilled out further with a pin vise and 
a wire was inserted, completing the detailing. And from there, this now brings us to the model's paint and the markings. Now, one of the requests that was asked upon me by the customer was that he wanted this build to emulate as much as possible the Tamiya M60A1 box art. And that vehicle, as we all know, utilizes an all olive drab paint scheme. Now for this build here, I went with the usual color tones that I go for these 1960s, 1970s era of American vehicles. And the weathering is also typically seen on my other builds of the same period. Now for the markings, this is a mix of both decals and dry transfers. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find a spare decal sheet for the original or even the re-released Tamiya M60A1 kit. And believe it or not, as strange as it sounds, there are almost no decals on the market for the M60A1, which is quite astounding because it is a really popular kit and there are so many marking options available, but for some reason, companies like Bison or Echelon or even Trant, or uh, I should say Archer, never went around making decals for it, which guys, seriously, get off your collective asses and make decals for these damn uh, M60s. But so the way you see it here, the, the markings were basically again cobbled together. Now, all of the stars are from the Archer Dry Transfers and they are awesome. I have a link to these sets in the, in the description below and they went on without any problems. I always, I, I actually, I really do like dry transfers. I use them a lot on my 116 builds, but for 135s are also, again, recommended. Now for the star location, this is directly off of the Tamiya instruction sheet. This also includes the one here on the back. And the most interesting one I find is the one here on the turret, which is here in the corner, which it just drives my OCD nuts because generally they're either over here in the front or some here in the back. But that corner one, eh. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, again, I'm just following the instruction sheet. Now for the number 53 in the yellow circle, this was a hodgepodge where I went ahead and painted the circle here with yellow paint and the 53 are again Archer dry transfers. From the 53 takes to the side markings and these two are from the Archer dry transfer set that I mentioned before. Where I went ahead and used decals are for the T, O, and E marks found here on the front and also here on the back. For these markings, luckily I had some spares left over from the Dragon M60 build that I did a little while ago. So with a combination of those two sets, I was able to fully mark the model to the way you see it here. And before I move on, one area of the paintwork that I forgot to mention are the two front sections here. Now this is specifically true for the M60 family. On the M60 family, the two front sections here in the bow area near the tin work are actually made from rubber. And whenever you're doing an M60 build, be sure to paint these with a black or a dark gray rubber type coloring as this always really makes the models pop compared to just leaving them oversprayed. And since it was requested by the customer, here we have the M60A1 compared to the original M60. Now note the biggest difference between these two vehicles is of course the geometry and shape of the turret. The original M60 utilized a turret shape and design which was very similar to the one used on the M48 pattern. While on the A1, the turret's geometry was completely redesigned. Now, if anyone's wondering exactly why, well, if you look at the two vehicles from the front, you'll have your answer. On the original M60, it was deemed that this design would, can be penetrated more easily from rounds coming in directly from the front here while on the M60A1's needle nose pattern, the rounds would have a better chance of deflection due to the geometry of the shape. Also, if you look at the, the length of the two turrets, I wouldn't be surprised if the 
M68-1's turret was more roomier and had more ammunition storage compared to the interior layout found on the original M60. But this is just a hunch. If anyone, of course, does know this information more thoroughly, feel free to mention that in the comment section listed below. At the end of the day, I'm really happy in how this build turned out. Like we've seen at the beginning of this video, this model was definitely one that had seen better days and in all fairness would have probably wound up in a landfill somewhere, which definitely is something that I want to see avoided. Having the model now in the configuration that you see it here, it's definitely a complete reversal. I mean, if you compare the two images side by side, like what you've seen here on the screen, well, frankly, I can't believe this is the same car. And that makes me feel good. Now, if anyone has a build in similar condition that this one was in here and are thinking about either relegating it to the spare parts bin or even worse, the trash can, perhaps you might want to pump your brakes a bit because with a little bit of elbow grease, you can polish up one of these older builds. And in many cases, the second time is a charm. Well, from here, the model's gonna be boxed up nice and carefully and then shipped back to the customer where he'll put it in a nice dust-free environment and the piece will be adorning his collection with his other pieces, which again, puts nothing but a big smile on my face. Actually, on second thought, I'm not, reg I'm not looking forward to shipping it out because I really, really, really like this build. And in fact, I'm a bit jealous for the owner. Well, looks like I gotta head on eBay to track down another m 68 kit, but mm, looks like that'll be the topic and subject matter for a future video for another day. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale M60A1 main battle tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, be it small scale model showcase videos like this guy over here, or the larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted on this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are showcased on the ECA channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detailed components. Thanks for watching. Till next time.